Can you hear me? You need me to scream and yell this morning so everybody can hear me? Amen. I don't need any help doing that anyway. The hard part's me not doing that. Praise the Lord. If you got your Bibles, let's turn to James chapter 2. We'll just say a prayer over the word. As we've been studying James, the first part of the chapter 1, we learned the purpose of the testing was that you may be perfect and tire wanting nothing. That God does not solicit us to do evil. And he says, James warns, do not err, my beloved brethren. And the test of obedience is to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. And that a doer shall be blessed in his deed. And then, fourthly, last week, we heard the test of true religion. And the goal of that religion is to keep himself unspotted from the world. The test of true religion is to be able to control the tongue and then serve. Amen. Serve the fatherless and widows. You know who the fatherless are? How many divorced, broken homes have fatherless kids in them right now in America? There's no shortage of the fatherless. Let me tell you that. Do you know that 93% of households that the man receives Jesus Christ, 93% of those households will go become Christian? That's how important the father is in the home. And that you're almost 800 times as likely to go to prison if you grew up without a father. Why do you think there's a war on men, amen, a war on masculinity, a war on the family? Because the devil knows the covenant was with a man and a woman, amen. Let's get into it today, though, James chapter 2. Just going to pray over the word real quick and ask the Lord to help me. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help me now to preach the word of God in truth and in spirit. I pray for the Holy Ghost to come up over all of us that we might receive a word out of heaven today. Get me out of the way, Lord God. Let me be a vessel that speaks the truth of the word of God today that we might receive you, Lord. Not me, not the word as I present it, but the word from God. And I pray, Lord God, that we would have something go down deep into our hearts today that would grow there like a mustard seed and would become the greatest of the plants, Lord. It would just flourish in us and we would have a change of heart today because, Lord, you've come to make us born again. Not just nice people, but born again believers in Jesus Christ. Lord, help us today to receive the book and to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So as we begin in chapter 2, we're going to look at three points this week that continue why there is a testing of faith. Why does the Lord test our faith? We see that in chapter 2, we're going to see the test of brotherly love, the test of good works, and we're going to look at the illustration of Abraham as an example. He begins in verse 1. He says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Do not show favoritism in the Lord Jesus Christ. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, in raggedy clothes, smelling like cigarettes, kids are all over up and down the aisle, you're not supposed to treat that rich family better than you are that poor family. You're not supposed to treat Donald Trump better than you are the junkie under the bridge because I'll guarantee you Jesus Christ would be under the bridge right now preaching to the lost. He wouldn't be on Wall Street. He wouldn't be at Capitol Hill. He wouldn't be down at the bank. 
He would be where the lost people are. Can I get an amen in the house of God? He would be. I tell you something. He says, if you have respect to him that weareth the nice clothes and say unto him, sit here in a good place and say to the poor, stand there or sit here under my footstool, are you not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? You know, we say we want revival in America but I heard a man put it very well. He said, we want a middle, upper class, white, suburbanite revival. We don't want a real revival because a real revival would have a house full of people who are unchurched, uncouth, broken, broke, and have problems. And the Lord would bring them in by the thousands and it would collapse the church as we know it today because God would wipe away all our little programs and all our little ideas of what we think is good or right and the Spirit of the Lord would come down and all of a sudden God would be in control of the church and we wouldn't anymore. And God forbid that the, the big boys who like to call themselves this and that wouldn't have charge over the church that Jesus Christ is in charge of. Amen. When I used to pastor, one thing that I always bothered me, and I talked to us about it several times, if you hear a baby making a bunch of noise in church, don't swing around and look at that family. They're already going through enough. They got in the car this morning. The kids were resisting getting dressed. Everybody's trying to get dressed. Everybody's fighting. By the time you get in the car, you're ready not to go. You can fight all the way down there trying to get everybody to calm down. Get in there. Kids aren't you sitting in church to begin with. You're not sh quite sure how the pastor's preaching because you're not used to going to church. You're trying to go to church, and now everybody in the church is staring at you every time your kid makes a mumble. And you get done and you didn't get much out of it but trying to keep your kids still so nobody looked at you and you're like, it just ain't worth it. It was too much trouble. I didn't get nothing out of that anyway. I know because that was our family and I was the pastor of the church. Amen. Every Sunday. And my wife had to, we sat right on the front row. We finally got them lined out where they didn't crawl under the deal and everything else. But, you know, all eyes were on us to begin with. I'll never forget one night a man come walking in with dreadlocks on a Wednesday night, barefoot with shorts on. He spent all summer with us back that year. But he had a crazy backstory. But once I got to know him, he was in our church every week, and uh, his name was Tim Meadows, and he was, a, he was one of the best guys I've ever met, and he still has dreadlocks, and he's still running around New Jersey, but the Lord dealt with him and I that summer, and he come in on a Wednesday night right in the middle of the service, was skateboarding around town. Beaver City, Nebraska. He fit in about like, like Kobe or I would fit in in New York City right downtown. We'd just stick out like a sore thumb. But the Lord used him to bless us and to teach us to stop looking at the outward and look at the inward because God told Samuel, the Lord told Samuel, stop looking at their appearance. He said, you're looking at, at Jesse's kids when he went to anoint David as king. He said, you're looking at them by what they look like. He said, I don't search the outward appearance. I search the heart. Amen. They thought so little of David, they never even brought him in out of the field. And he was the one that God had chosen to be king over Israel, the shepherd. Of course he would choose a shepherd to be king over Israel. Amen. But it wasn't because he looked like a king. It wasn't because he acted like a king. It wasn't because everybody thought he ought to be king. It was because God said he was king. Amen. And how many people are you passing by because of the way they look 
that you're missing a great blessing in your life by somebody being a man of God. Because if you saw me a few years ago, you would say to yourself, that man ain't going to make it much longer. He won't live much longer. You would not see me up here preaching. Amen, I'll guarantee you. You know who did see me up here preaching? My great-grandmother, my mother was 13 years old, pregnant with me. Quite the scandal in 1971, I'll guarantee you. If I'd have been born in 1973, you think I'd still be here after Roe v. Wade? My great-great-grandmother was a God-fearing woman, Holy Ghost-filled woman like you'd never seen before in your life. She looked at my mother one day and said, that boy will be a preacher. He'll be born with a veil. And the darker the veil, the more he'll have to go through to be the preacher, but he will be a preacher. Well, a veil is an extra layer of skin over your face. The old-timers called it a call, C-A-U-L. But they peel that layer, of, that membrane off of your face. Usually they're blue. Mine was black. The darker it is, the more he'll have to go through to get there, but the more God will use him. My grandmother Larson, who was my favorite person in the world, uh, you know, begrudging against my mom because I always told her how great my grandma was, amen would tell everybody when I was knee deep in sin and hard things as, a, as someone who was an outlaw and far away from everything that was good and right, she said, that man's going to be a preacher. And they said, Catherine, that man's not even going to live to be 25. He's not going to be a preacher. No, God said he'll be a preacher. Now, my grandma didn't live to see it, but she believed what God said. Amen. Amen. Now, when I stand up here and preach about not being a respecter of persons, you're talking to somebody who knows what that's like. Because when I would walk through somewhere, people would grab their kids by them and hold them away from me. Now, when I go by places, babies are staring at me. God shows it to me all the time. You know why? Because a baby's straight from the source. A baby don't look at you by your appearance. It sees the light in you. Amen. Babies are drawn to the light. Praise the Lord. Isn't that a gift, Don? That's what the Lord can do. He didn't look at me and say, here's a broken, drug addict, violent, hard man who's been running and running and running. He looked at me and said, there is a witness of the power of God in the salvation that can do what only God can do and can make old things pass away and behold all things become new. I'm standing before you today this morning and I'm saying to you, if you look at someone by their appearance and you judge them that way, you are sinning according to the good book. Amen. That is a word from the Lord. He says right here in James chapter 2, Are you not then partial in yourselves and become judges of evil thoughts? Being a respecter of persons, showing favoritism, and judging someone is a sin according to God. Do I look at someone who appears to be dangerous and let them come into my house and have run in my house? No, that's common sense. But if I look at someone because I don't like their appearance, because of the clothes they're wearing, their behavior, their attitude, or the way they talk, look, or any other reason, James says, you become Judges of evil thoughts, you are thinking evilly according to the Lord. I had somebody ask me when I go into the prisons to preach, well, how do you know they're saved? I said, how do I know you're saved? 
Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ saves anybody. Amen. It ain't because you're good. Yeah, nobody on this earth good. The Lord said that. Not one. No, not one is good. When they asked Jesus about him being good, he said, why do you call me good? Only my father is good. Amen. Hallelujah. See, why do you think, brothers and sisters, the TV has you pitted against one another all day long? Who is the deceiver? What does the deceiver do? He comes to kill, steal, and destroy, cause division. He comes to cause uh, this, this, oh Lord, what's the word? It's in six things God hates. One of them is causing dissension in the brothers, causing trouble amongst each other. Causing fighting in amongst ourselves. You know something? If one of the prayers you could pray this week, I pray one of the prayers would be, help me see people with my father's eyes. Help me see people with my father's eyes. Help me see my children with my father's eyes. Help me see my wife with my father's eyes. Help me see myself as my father's eyes. Help me see my enemies with my father's eyes. Help me see the world with my father's eyes. How many people in here were sinners before they gave their life to Jesus Christ? You know you can't get your name in the book unless you're a sinner. Amen. Nobody in heaven is going to heaven if they're not a sinner. The thing that Jesus puts right at the front is, I confess my sins, he is quick to forgive. But we have to come to the point where we say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Well, Don, your sins aren't better than his sins. Amen. Kobe, your sins aren't better than my sins, and your deeds aren't better than my deeds. We're all humble servants of the same Lord trying to make it to the same place. And I don't care what anybody says, when you got to heaven, is there anybody when you're at the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne judgment when we sit with Christ as judges against the world, are you going to cheer on when somebody gets thrown into hell because they didn't receive what we have received, grace and mercy? No. It will be a solemn, solemn day, the day of the Lord. And I pray that none of us would have withheld the grace and love that's been given to us by God if we had an opportunity to give it back to somebody else. Can I get an amen? He says, hearken, my beloved brethren, has not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to them that love him? But you have despised the poor, do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Isn't that going on today? Where do most of our problems come from right now? The big boys, the billionaires, amen. They think they ought to be able to run the world. They own it all. Why shouldn't we be able to control everybody? Do you know when America in the Great Depression... World War I, World War II, Great Depression, when nobody had nothing, that's when America was at its finest. You ever notice a tornado hits a place and everybody gets wrecked and everything gets leveled and all of a sudden it doesn't matter what kind of house you lived in or what kind of car you drove, people are going to help dig other people out because all of a sudden everybody's equal and we care about each other. Sometimes the Lord's got to wreck your house to put it in order again. Amen. Sometimes the Lord will do that to the church too. Sometimes the Lord will split it right down the middle, clean it out, and then he says, now we can begin again because the focus is on me and not on who's in charge of this committee or that committee. Hallelujah. You know, I think of down where I'm from. I go down and preach in the hills. 
You know, when, I, when you look at Branson and the Ozarks and uh, Bentonville, Arkansas, Bentonville, Arkansas, it's exploding because Walmart made a law where everybody who uh, does any work for Walmart has to live within 500 miles. So every company that does business with Walmart has to have a, a representative within 500 miles. Northwest Arkansas is exploding. And where Hopewell Holler Church is, amen, down in, in Arkansas, right smack down in the middle of nothing. More millionaires there per capita than anywhere in Arkansas. But you wouldn't know it driving by. But when I was growing up down there, and out in Missouri, it was dirt poor. I mean poor. It did, the land didn't grow anything but rocks. But you know something? That area had the Holy Ghost. The churches were on fire. And the people loved each other and took care of each other like you never saw. Now, everybody lost the Holy Ghost. They got big churches like everybody else. They traded their birthright for a bowl of beans. What did we trade in America for wealth and an ease of life? We traded the Holy Ghost. We traded leaning on God. We traded the things of the spirit realm for the things of the natural realm. And the truth is, what good is it to gain the whole world and lose your very own soul? What good is it to have everything and have not God? Have not God chosen the poor Of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to them that love him. Do you know that 53% of the world lives on $2 a day or less? We've been down to Honduras, and I've seen families that live in houses. Their houses look like my uh, chicken barn. And their families were well-dressed, well-behaved, and loved each other more than I see most people in America do. Why? Because all they had was each other. And, every, and each other was all that mattered. Hallelujah. They took care of what they had. The church was vibrant. People loved each other. I thought, Lord, we were riding around down there. My son James went down there, a cocky wrestler. He spent a week riding around the back of that truck. He come back a humble man. I thank God. I think every kid ought to go, every per American needs to go on a trip abroad and see what the world has and what we have and the difference because we have everything. They want what we have, but I feel like we need what they have. Hallelujah. We can trade it over. Give them some of their wealth. Hallelujah. I heard a man who was a preacher went to China. They told him the first four hours we do Bible study. The second four hours we do praise and worship. And then the third four, four hours we have you preach. And he said, what? They didn't have any chairs and they were all standing in a place where it was about 100 degrees in a cave with no air conditioning. And they said, yeah, we want... He said, well, how many of you gone to prison for your faith? Every one of them put their hands up. They said, well, we get three years every time we get caught. He said, well, how many of you... Uh, there's about 120 of them, he said, and he said... How many of you, how many people you got over you? They all counted up, and then finally they said, we've got almost um, two million under us. And you've all been to prison for your faith, yes. And he said, you have, you have church that last 12 hours? He said, yes. But we're hoping you can teach us how to be more like you in America. And he said, no. No. He said, I, I don't want you to be like us. We want to be like you. Because we, we come in these nice air-conditioned palaces with coffee bars and everything else. Hallelujah! And we're uncomfortable if it goes an hour. I know because I'm always long-winded so I can see it on everybody's face. Amen! The truth is, they've lived under oppression. They got the gospel. They didn't get the church that we think about. They got the gospel. 
See, God has chosen the people that we think haven't got much are the ones he's come to give the most to. Verse 8 is a powerful verse. And verse 9. He says, if you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convicted of the law, convinced of the law as transgressors. If you love your neighbor as you love yourself, you love your neighbor, you're doing good. But if you're loving people according to your own biases, you're a sinner. That's what the Bible says. That's not Jamie Hargett. That's the Bible. One thing about in prison that I always liked. Everybody wore the same kind of clothes. Everybody ate the same kind of food. Basically, everybody had the same. You know what it comes down to when you're in prison? What's your word? If you ain't got your word, you ain't got nothing. If you say you love Jesus and you don't walk the talk, they don't respect you. But if you walk the talk, they respect you and leave you alone. Amen. It doesn't matter what kind of car you're driving. doesn't matter how much weight you sold or didn't sell or how, who your connections were because it didn't matter in there, did it? Amen. It really, it shouldn't matter in here either, should it? We're all sinners serving the same master and we're all hoping to go to the same place and we all have kids who need the Lord and grandkids, we're praying, get the Lord and we're all praying for the same end. Lord, help us. Lord, give us grace. And if we want grace, Jesus said, he had come to give grace for grace. He gives us grace so that we can give grace away. Hallelujah. We're not to store up extra grace. That grace, he said, it's rivers of flowing water. It comes out of heaven and comes right through you, out on to everybody around you. Hallelujah. I pray our cups would overflow with the love and power and glory of God's grace, mercy, righteousness, peace, and love in the Holy Ghost. Amen. That everybody who's around us would say, I know that man or woman is a believer because I felt it on them. You didn't come up to somebody who you didn't like the way they looked and you had the Bible, you said, oh, no, no, this ain't for you. No, this is for them. But you, you can't have none of what Jesus died on the cross for. This is only for us. Does that make sense? It didn't make sense to James either, Jesus' brother, the first bishop of the church. He said, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all of it. Whoever's committed one sin has committed all the sin it takes to be damned and go to hell. Amen. Whoever has received one drop of blood have received a whole drop of blood because God's mercy is for all. Praise the Lord for that. I don't serve a king who is like a worldly king who says only me and only the people that I decide. He said, for God loved the whole world. Whosoever should believe in me should not perish but have everlasting life. Isn't that something? Whosoever I'm a whosoever. Amen. There's nobody that Jesus Christ didn't die for. He says, if you, says, do not commit adultery, do not kill, now thou commit not adultery, but if you kill, you've broken the same laws. Amen. If you lie, you're just as guilty as a killer. And if you don't love somebody, you're a Pharisee. It's a tricky road, isn't it, brothers and sisters, when we get right down to it in the book of James. But the beautiful thing is that this is one of my favorite verses in this whole book. For he shall have judgment without mercy on those that showed no mercy. Listen. 
and mercy rejoices against judgment. Some versions say mercy triumphs over judgment. God's mercy defeats Satan's accusations all day long because the accuser of the brethren is all day saying, look at those hypocrites who say one thing in church and go out and do another. And the Lord says, I know they are, but they're mine. I died for them, I love them, and I cover them in the blood. And it's the blood that saves them, not their works. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Praise the Lord, I can't do it in my flesh. I'm not good enough. I never will be good enough. That's why Jesus came to the earth, was to die for sinners, and of which we're all sinners. Now, do we stand at bay and let people who love sin come in and snatch our children and drag them to hell? No. We teach them. But we ourselves are not to be the ones who say, well, you, you're okay, but you, you're not. Can I get an amen? Amen. Because they had to be careful for that because that's what the devil does, isn't it? See, the devil pits us all against one another and he says, none of you are any good. You all deserve the same treatment we, we fallen angels got. Judgment. But the Lord said, I give to Adam and his descendants mercy. That's the only hope anybody has on the earth. God's mercy. Because otherwise, hellfire awaits everybody. And that's the facts. Amen. He says the test of good works. He says, what does it profit, my brethren, though a man he say faith has faith and has not worked, can faith save him? Can you say I got faith and go on living, running around, doing all the same things you always did before? Have you been born again? That's where we're kind of at in the church right now, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Where's the fruit? He says you'll know them by their fruit. I wonder how so many people say they met the living God and then nothing changed whatsoever at all. That doesn't say much about our God, does it? Or did they actually give their life to him? Or did they say what it took to get what they wanted? Can I get an amen? amen? Don't rob yourself of true salvation by just getting the get out of hell free card. If you're going to receive it, receive it all. Go after it. Go after it like you went after your flesh. Go after God like you're going after everything you want in life. Go after him as hard as you're going after whatever it is you're going after that doesn't have anything to do with him. Because there is a bountiful blessing in a righteous man or woman who will go after God as hard as they can because he says, if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. Amen. He says, I give you the fountain of the water of life freely. Come and drink all you will. He doesn't limit your access to him. He doesn't limit your access to his grace. He doesn't limit your access to his spirit. The only limit that God puts on us is sin. The rest of it, we have an open door through the blood of Jesus Christ. Why is there limitations on what we can do? A, we're seeking God in the flesh. B, we're seeking God in name only. Amen. We want selfish reasons. He says you pray, but you're praying for yourself. You're not praying for God's will to be done. Amen. Sometimes God's will, brothers and sisters, that we have less. He may not give you a bunch of money. It might destroy your life. Hey, man, what's the devil do? The devil come in as the most beautiful woman you ever saw in your life. If he can draw away and destroy your marriage and suck you into adultery, the enemy will always give you the beginning. He never shows you the end. Hallelujah. He always shows you, feed the flesh, take this bread like he told Jesus, eat it. Don't deny yourself for God. 
satisfy your flesh right now. But Jesus was fasting for God. He said, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Man does not live on things, pleasure, all these things. They're temporary. They're gone. We stand before the Lord. But I tell you what, if you learn to live by faith and seek God for things that you don't hardly understand how they can come about and you begin to step out of your limits and you begin to step in to his endlessness and power, you'll see miracles. You'll see things you never thought could happen. Amen. The Lord took us from 70,000 a year. He took me down to 11,000 a year in eight months. I, bought, I paid my house off five months early with a COVID check. I had $2 in the bank and I paid my house off early because the Lord said, give on to Caesars. What is Caesars? I've been living by faith going on three years now and I've gone all over America, done everything I need. I don't live, I don't have a job. I do whatever God gives me. Whatever God gives me, I do it. Amen? There's always enough. Why? Because I am going by faith and I have works to show it. God says, go here and do this. Well, how am I with the money? Have I, am I not Jehovah Jireh? Am I not your provider? Will there not be enough? If you have physical limitations, will not God help you reach the places you need to be? If you're struggling spiritually, if you keep going by faith, will not God meet those needs? Amen. The test of good works is a test that shows I'm not just saying this. Here's proof in my life. If somebody did a forensic study of your life, would they be able to find proof that you're a Christian? If they went, if a detective backtracked your life and said, is this person a Christian, would they be able to prove it in a court of law? If you have works that match your faith, then everybody can see it. Can I get an amen? Amen. It'll match your life. It'll match what you're saying. And glory be to God for that. You know, you don't have to be an evangelist to be, have works in your life. Steadfast commitment to your marriage, steadfast commitment to your family, your life oftentimes, a simple, humble life is a glorious uh, uh, witness of the peace of God in your life. You know that? You know, I told, I seen a man, I heard about a man, and I know I'm going along here, I'm going to try to hurry, we're almost to the end of chapter two. A man was playing golf in a Bob Hope tournament. And he come in afterwards, and this man was famous. I can't think of his name because they really didn't mention it in the story. But he was slamming the locker doors around, and he was all upset. And this other famous actor said, why are you so upset? And he said, oh, he said, I got stuck playing golf with Billy Graham and Bob Ford today, and Billy Graham wouldn't shut up about Jesus. And he said, really? He said, yeah, all day long. He said, what did he say? He said, oh, he didn't say nothing, but I knew what he was thinking. Hallelujah, Hallelujah true story. Billy Graham didn't have to preach a word about God because God was all through him, in him, and upon him, and all those who came in contact with him felt the power of God in him. The same way with you. If you are living for God and Jesus Christ filled with grace, mercy, love, peace, and hope, you do not know the witness you are to others who are coming in contact with you because you are a form of Christ that may be the only form of Christ they ever witness with their own eyes and receive. You may be God's witness to them of the power of Christ on the earth because it lives in you. 
That is a powerful testimony of works. Because you don't have to go around doing a bunch of ministry to be a mannered woman of God. How you live your life and how you walk out your family and how you treat your, your neighbors, strangers, and your enemies is an incredible witness to the love and grace of God that lives in you. Can I get an amen? That's a good witness. Let's finish this up. This is one of the most famous lines in the whole book, but he says, even so, if faith, if it has not works, is dead faith, it is, if it is being alone. Faith without works is dead faith. Where's the fruit? Do you say you're a believer in Jesus Christ? Where's your fruit? Hallelujah. Because a good tree cannot produce bad fruit and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. And Jesus Christ said, they'll know you by your fruit. If you are living in Christ, he'll prune you, he'll get fruit from you. Amen. Finally, the illustration of Abraham, and we'll bring this in. He says, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? When he put Isaac down, he put everything he had down there on that altar right there and was prepared to kill him and burn him for God. He was justified by his faith right there. He didn't understand what God was going to do or why God was going to ask him to do such a, a, a hard thing. But he trusted God that whatever it was, it was right. And God stopped him and provided the sacrifice with a ram in the bushes. Do you notice that that ram, instead of being a lamb, Jesus Christ was a full-grown lamb, wasn't he? That was a picture of Christ. God offered his son the same way he asked Abraham to. Only he brought Abraham to the limit of his understanding. And Abraham did what God was showing him to do. Do you know... God went through with what he asked Abraham to do. He gave his only son on the altar. He went all the way through with it. For as the body is without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Are you walking the talk? Are you loving your neighbors as you love yourselves? Listen. Take these things away today. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Faith without works is dead. And Abraham, because he had these things, was called a friend of God. So far in the book of James, we can say, the reason God tests us is that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing spiritually. You'll have everything you need. Do not err, my beloved brethren, but be a doer of the word, and a doer shall be blessed in his deeds. It is the purpose of all this is to keep yourself unspotted from the world. For mercy triumphs over judgment. Faith without works is dead so that you may be called a friend of God like Abraham. Can I get an amen? amen. Is that worthy? That's a, that is a practical walk. Amen. That's not up here where we can't understand it. That brings it right down to earth. James is good about that. It's practical faith in a practical world that is getting harder and harder to live it out. It's going to cost us something soon. It's not going to be free and easy. And you're not going to get out of boys and pats on the back before long. But if you're living for God, whatever comes, comes. God's will be done. Amen. I'm not living for right here and right now. I'm living and storing my riches in heaven. 
That's where I belong anyway. Hallelujah. So that's why I dress like this today. You know me. I like to dress up when I preach anyway. It gives me confidence. But if Donald Trump come walking in here and Joe Biden come walking in here and they both fell down right there and pled the blood of Jesus over their lives, over their sins, and over their, over their children, the Lord would meet them just the same right where they were as one people, two sinners. He wouldn't respect their party, their beliefs, their background, or their achievements. He would see them as two sinners who are pleading for mercy over their sins. And I say to you today, if not by the grace of God, there go I. None of us deserve it. It's all a gift and it's grace. Receive it and give it to others as it was given to us. Can I get an amen? amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that we have proof. Proof that you're alive. Proof that you're working in us. There's proof, Lord. We have faith that has works. We have evidence that Jesus Christ is real because he's in real in us. And we were one way before and now we're another. God did this, this, this in my life. And he did this, this, this in your life. And hallelujah, praise God that he has. I thank you for that, Jesus. I know a lot of good people, Lord, who don't have you. Socially, they do everything that we in here approve of. But they're just as lost as those we don't approve of. Because without the blood of Jesus, nobody's getting in. Nobody's getting born again. It has to go through the cross. There's no way to the Father but through the Son. And I pray for a revival in our land. I pray for a renewal in our land. And I pray for a revival beginning with us here this morning. That we would receive from heaven the power of God to love our enemies as we love ourselves. The power of God to walk it out. To not walk around as hypocrites, but walk around as humble servants of God who are looking and seeking that someone might be saved. Lord, I ask you today that you'd fill this church with your fire and the Holy Ghost. That there would be a, a fresh wind blow through the Baptist church. That a fire of God would burn in here and it would go, start in here and it would burn out there. Lord, it would burn in each one of us wherever we're at. Whoever we encounter, they would encounter you living in us. That we wouldn't be Christians in name only, but we would be born again and on fire for God, filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. And we would be filled with the love that Jesus filled us with, and we would give that love away. And Lord, we know that the enemy is working hard to destroy your witness in America. Lord, sometimes you put people through hell to get them to heaven. Sometimes if people say we don't want God, you'll see what it's like when you don't have him. Maybe you, maybe you were wrong about that. Maybe the Lord is allowing us to see what it's like without him so that we'll turn back to him before it's too late. I pray for these young ones, Lord. I pray they would get filled with the Holy Ghost. I pray they would be born again and they would be steadfast standing on the rock of Jesus in Scripture and nobody could ever talk them out of it. And I pray, Lord, for all of our children and our children's children all over the earth. Lord, help them. Lord, help them. They need it. And help us, Lord, to be the witnesses that they can look to to see how it's done and done right. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Hey, this is Pastor Jeffrey Plummer. I want to thank you for watching our sermon video today. Our sermon video is available on our website, which is www.cbccne.org. On that website, you will find sermon video as well as a blog that I write each week to our fellowship here at the church. At the top of the website in the corner, you can see all of those links that can get to that information. 
You can also learn about our church with our church history in the About page to be able to find out what we're all about here in Cambridge, Nebraska. Again, I want to thank you for watching our sermon video today, and I pray that you have a blessed day.